Right, sorry about that. I don't know what happened to my volume. Thank you, Rosemary, for telling me that my volume was bad. I'm so glad you were there. It would have been horrible if people couldn't hear me. Um, so I hope that that's solved the issue. Um, right, thank you for that, Rosemary. Okay, I will make sure I check that every time from now on. Okay, so let's carry on. So now that we've identified that we have to use this equation here, we can go Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2a delta x. Right, so we're solving for Vf, right? So we're going to substitute in. So we've got 8 squared plus 2 times by a, which is 9.8, times by 1.8. And you can pop that in your calculator and you end up with a final velocity VF of 9.96 meters per second, negative one, meters per second. Okay, now you always need to check your answer and it says calculate the magnitude of the velocity. And because they've asked you to check the magnitude of the velocity, you can see that actually you don't have to give a direction. If they just asked you to calculate the velocity, you'd have had to say downwards because this is positive. But since they've asked you just to calculate the magnitude of the velocity, you can just write 9.96 meters per second. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Now it says, how long does the ball take to hit the floor? Okay, so I've written all over this and I'm going to just erase this writing and then start again with some information. I'm actually gonna change color as well. I don't like the color. Okay, so what do we know? We know that the initial velocity was eight. We know that the final velocity was 9.96. We know the displacement was 1.8. Let's look at our equations again. We've got Vf equals Vi plus A delta T. Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2A delta X. Delta X is equal to Vi delta T plus a half A delta T squared. And delta X is equal to Vf plus Vi over 2 delta T. Okay, right, and it says, how long does it take the ball to hit the floor? Well, again, we're going to look at the information we have, okay, the variables. We've got VF, which is 9.96, VI, which is 8, A is 9.8, and delta X equals, delta X is 1.8, and we want delta T, we want delta T. Okay, and basically, again, remember always that we are staying with the fact that downwards is positive. Now we want to find out a change in time. So you can see that there are three equations with time in them, but we're solving for time. So I personally would just go with the first one because it's easiest, where we've got Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T. Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T. So your final velocity is 9.96, the initial velocity is 8 plus 9.8 delta t. So if we subtract that and work it out, we get that delta t is equal to 0, 0,2 seconds. So it took 0, 0.2 seconds to fall from here down onto the ground. Right, let's move on to the next question. Oh, okay, let me just erase all the writing. It says the ball bounces inelastically. What does that mean? It means that energy is not conserved. Energy is not conserved, okay? Where the velocity of the ball decreases by 20%, not to 20%, by 20%, and the ball is in contact with the floor for 0, 0,1 seconds. 
no care. So in other words, the ball goes down, doing, and then it bounces up, doing, and during that time is 0, 0,01 seconds. And as it comes up, it has a smaller velocity. Now it says determined by means of calculations whether the ball will reach the ceiling after its first bounce on the floor. Okay. So let's think about this. The first thing we have to do is find out what velocity it actually is going up towards the ground, okay? I mean, up towards the ceiling. Okay, so what is actually happening is, yeah, is the ball's coming down, wing, and then it's coming back up, doing. Okay, right. So <laughs> over here, we know that it started at eight. It hit 9.96 there. Okay, we have no idea what this velocity is, but it is 80% of 9.96, right? It loses 20%. And we want to know, is it going to reach the ceiling, which is up there? Is it going to reach the ceiling? This height here is 1.8. And this height here is 3.5. Okay, so that is what's happening. So the first thing I would do is find out that velocity there. Okay, so Basically, we want 80% of 9.96. So you can pop that in your calculator. You can just go 0, 0,8 times 9.96. And you end up with 7.97 meters per second. So therefore, we know this ball is now going upwards at a velocity of 7.97 meters per second. So again, now we can just think about it putting in our equations of motion, we've got that the initial velocity now is negative 7,97 because remember grade 12, we chose downwards as positive. It is now going up. So the initial velocity is now minus 7.97. The final velocity if it was just to reach the ceiling, or what if we want to find out what the height is, the final velocity is zero. If we want to know what height, maximum height it reaches, we're going to have the final velocity equals zero. The acceleration is now negative 9,8. Why? Because we chose downwards as positive, but it's now going up. Okay, and we want to know delta x. That's what we want to know. So we can substitute into vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a delta x. Our final velocity is zero. The initial velocity is minus 7 comma 9 7 squared plus 2 times minus 9 comma 8 delta x. And therefore, we can solve delta x to equal, what does it equal? It becomes 3,24 meters. 3,24 meters. So that means it does not reach the ceiling because the ceiling is 3.5 meters. Now listen, grade 12, just writing down 3.24 meters is not going to get you all the marks in this question. There is a mark allocated for actually answering the question. It says, determine by means of calculations whether the ball will reach the ceiling after its first bounce on the floor. And the correct answer is no. And why not? Because it only reaches 3.24 meters. Please don't think that in the exams, if you don't understand how to do this question, you can just guess yes or no. And if you guess no, you'd get a mark. No, the way it works is that this has to be based on your evidence. So the good news is that if you worked out that this was 3.7, if you made a silly mistake and you worked out this was 3.7, then wrote yes, you would get a mark for the yes, even though this was wrong. But you cannot just write down no. Okay. Right, now let's do the next part of this question. Oh, okay, again, let's erase all my writing. Obviously, you guys won't have to erase all your writing because you will have bigger paper. Okay, so let's just write down all the information we had before we read this, because I think we're gonna need it, okay? We had an initial velocity of eight meters per second going downwards. We hit the ground over here at 9.96. We bounced back up at 7.97. And we reached a height of 3,24 at 
and there was a time difference here of naught comma I think it was naught two seconds or naught not coming not one second let me just look not coming not one second not coming not one second right now it says sketch a velocity time graph for the motion of the ball from the time the ball is thrown until it reaches the maximum height of the after the bounce clearly show the following in the graph the initial velocity of the ball the velocity of the time when the ball hits the floor the velocity and time when the ball leaves the floor okay now, it totally depends on whether you chose upwards as positive or negative as to what your graph looks like, okay? Since we chose downwards as positive, our graph is going to look a specific way, okay? And if you chose, if you chose upwards positive, you will get the mirror image, okay? We chose downwards as positive. Okay, now what you need to remember always is that when you're doing a velocity versus time graph, it is a vector. So therefore you have to have a positive and a negative side. Okay, and what we need to do now is work out what happens. So the positive, remember, I like to always help myself by doing this in pencil lightly. The positive is downwards. Remember that. Okay. And the negative is upwards. Remember that. That helps you a little bit. Okay. So this, this is in pencil. You're not actually drawing this. You will erase it afterwards if you want to make sure that the teachers don't think you're a little bit crazy. So erase it afterwards. Okay. So the velocity in meters per second, you always have to label and time in the seconds and grade 12s again just because it says sketch a velocity versus time graph does not mean it has to be neat unfortunately my equipment here does not allow me to use rulers you guys when you are drawing a sketch like this need to be using a pencil not a pen you need erasers erasers to make sure that you erase all your incorrect stuff neatly and you need rulers because you need to draw this out beautifully and neatly with a ruler right so now what does it say it says show the initial velocity of the ball well the initial velocity of the ball okay is eight meters per second okay now we chose downwards as positive so it starts off at eight and then it increases in velocity to 9.96. So it increases in velocity to 9.96. And we worked out that it took 0.2 seconds to do that. So at 0.2 seconds, it has reached 9. Oh, please don't do that in the exams. Don't color in like I've just done. It reaches 9,96. This should not be a double line like this. Unfortunately, I was just trying to make sure that you joined and it's a straight line. So that should be a straight line with a ruler. Right, then what happens? It is falling. At this point here, it hits the ground. And what does it do? It bounces. Okay, it bounces. And as it bounces, it obviously changes direction over there. So the next thing we know is that it is going upwards with a velocity of 7.97. .97. So we know it took 0.21 seconds to do this. And all of a sudden, it is going at minus 7,97. Okay, so we need to join these two dots. Oh not easy to do okay that's terrible you know what I'm gonna do watch I'll show you what I'm gonna do I'm gonna raise all the ink and I'm gonna go back one right let's do this here so we've got a much better bigger drawing okay it's a little bit better so we've got that this is going at eight it goes up to nine comma nine six and that is at 0.2 now at 0.21 it is now suddenly at minus 7 comma 9 7 it is minus 7 comma 9 7 because it's now bouncing upwards at 7 comma 9 7 meters per second okay it's bouncing up at that velocity 
So these two lines have to join with a straight line. And I'm really struggling to do this on this digital pad and pen, but that's the best I can do. Okay, that is supposed to be a straight line. Then what does it do? It now bounces up to the point where it reaches a final velocity, and that final velocity is zero before it goes. So what is it really doing? It's doing this. It's going boing, a little bit of a gap, and then bounces up and reaches a height okay so it goes up again to a zero velocity okay there we go at zero right so what did you need to show you needed to show the eight you needed to show the 9.96 at 0 0.2 you needed to show the minus 7.97 7 at 0.21 Okay, and that obviously you need to remember is your velocity in meters per second, and this is time in seconds. And another thing you need to realize, grade tools, which is pretty important, is that what is special about these two lines, this line here and this line here. Now, it's not evident in my drawing because my drawing is obviously not used with a drawn with a ruler. And it's not a nice pretty paper that you can see. But these two lines are parallel. And why is that? They are parallel because they are the gradient of a velocity versus time graph. And the gradient of a velocity versus time graph, delta V over delta T, is the acceleration. And in this case, the acceleration is due to the gravitational force which equals g so these two lines should be parallel okay i know they don't look like it in my drawing okay but that's because i haven't used a ruler and i haven't drawn to scale but they are parallel and that is because that there is a gradient which is the acceleration due to gravity Right, question three with 15 marks. Sure, that was a long question. Let's look at question three. Okay, so we have a crate of mass 86 kgs and it's accelerating down a surface inclined at an angle of 25 degrees to the horizontal. A man, there's a little dude, okay, and he's pushing with the force F up, upwards, parallel to the plane in an attempt to prevent the crate from sliding down. In spite of his efforts, the crate is still accelerating down the incline, and that's very important. The fact that it's accelerating down the incline, it's not just moving, it's not going at constant velocity, it's accelerating. Why is that important? Because acceleration means that you've got a what? You've got a net force. You've got a net force, and that's important. Okay, so let's have a look at the first question. The first question says applied force is a non-conservative force. What is meant by a non-conservative force? So this is a theory question. And what you need to understand about these theory questions, if they, what they, or they always tend to give you a theory question at the beginning of a long question, okay? Like this question is question three, it's with 15 marks. They throw in a nice little theory question at the beginning. And the reason they do that is because they want you to think about the theory and they're hinting as to what you're going to need to answer the rest of the questions in this question, okay? So, the official definition of a non-conservative force is a force for which the network done in any closed path is dependent on the path of the object traveled. I mean, path the object traveled. In other words, okay, a force for which the network done in any closed path is dependent on the path of the object traveled. They're saying that this force is dependent on the direct the the, the path that the object traveled. That is what is a non-conservative force. Right, I just erase my writing. Now it says the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, between the crate and the surface is 0, 0,22. So mu k is 0, 0,22. 
Prove that the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force is 168,04 newtons. Okay, and this is only worth two marks, which means you shouldn't be doing anything too complicated. So what you should be doing is going, well, Fk is equal to mu k Fn, or some of you might know it as mu k n, where n is the normal force. So that is the force that is perpendicular to the surface, okay? So in other words, this force here F is F n. So if I had to redraw this, let me just redraw it up here, okay? And we know that this angle here is 25 degrees, okay? And here is our crate, and that there is the normal force, Fn. Okay, oh, I'm so sorry, that's not Fn. Yes, it is Fn. Then this here is the force of gravity. Sorry, I had a blonde moment for a minute. Okay, then this yeah, this perpendicular component, yeah, that there is the force of gravity perpendicular, but that is equal to the normal force, okay, those to balance each other out. So if I can work out Fg perpendicular, I will have F normal, okay? So therefore, I could rewrite this as Fk is equal to mu k F g perpendicular okay and you guys should know that from normal slopes that fg perpendicular this little angle there is 25 degrees that's fg perpendicular this year is just the force of gravity so we're going to use sakatoa if you don't know sakatoa sine is opposite of our partners cos is adjacent to our partners tan is opposite over adjacent. We want this line here, which is adjacent to the angle, and that's the hypotenuse, which is what we have, so we're going to use cos. So therefore, we can say that this is equal to mu k times by fg cos of 25 degrees now, this is a lot of writing for two marks. The reason I'm doing this is because I want you to understand where this comes from, okay? If you guys understand where it comes from, it's very easy. You just substitute the value for Fg perpendicular into this. But if you don't, that's why I'm doing it slowly, and that's what the point of these lessons are, is to make sure you actually understand what's going on. Okay, so we've got mu k, which is 0, 22. Fg is 9.8 times the mass, and the mass is 86, so it's times 86 times 9.8, cos 25 degrees, and we get a final answer of 168,04 newtons. 168,04 newtons. And grade 12s, in physical science, this isn't maths, this isn't biology, in physical science, or life sciences, should I say, you always round off to two decimal places unless they tell you otherwise. Okay, so did they ask us to prove that the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force is 168.04, and we got 168.04, so life is good. Now, quick exam tip. If they ask you to prove that the magnitude, magnitude of the kinetic frictional force is 168.04, and you do the sum, and as far as you're concerned, it's perfect, and you do not get 168.04. I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to stress about it. I want you to think that maybe there's a typo. I'm not saying that there is necessarily a typo. Maybe you made a mistake, but do not panic. It's only worth two marks. Use the number they gave you, whatever number they gave you, use that number in the rest of the questions. The reason they've told you to prove that the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force is 168.04 newtons is because you're gonna need that value for other questions further down, okay? For the other sub-questions. If they'd just asked you to find the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force, then obviously it wouldn't have been as an important 
of a value. So here we know that we're going to be needing this kinetic frictional force of 168.04 newtons, and they're kind of giving it to you. Right, let's move on. So now it says state the work energy theorem in words. So again, we have a nice theory question. Okay, now again, grade 12 is another little exam tip. Learn your theorems, learn your theory, and it has to be word perfect. I have so many students that lose up to 10% in the exam papers because they're just too lazy to learn the work energy theorem or the other things, other theorems perfectly, word perfectly, okay? Because up to 10% of your exam can be these theory questions. And it just breaks my heart when I see a child not get an A or a first because they are not learning their theory. So it says, state the work energy theorem in words. The official definition is the network done on an object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Or you could write the work done on an object by resultant force is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Either one is correct. But again, Grade 12, think, what are they doing? They're asking us the work energy theorem because we're going to need it. We're going to need it in the next question. Right, let's move on to the next question then. It says draw, okay, not for this question then, but for the one after this. It says draw a labeled free body diagram of all the forces acting on the crate. So when you see the word free body, I want you to think dot okay not block dot in fact it is safe to draw a dot for any diagram whether it be a free body diagram or a force diagram it is safe to draw a dot so i would suggest you always do a dot okay so now let's think about this we want a free body diagram and i'm going to do it up here so we're going to do a free body diagram and I always draw in my slope in a dotted line because it helps me draw the forces in the correct angle. So here is my free body diagram, my dot, okay? And I want you to draw it nice and big. Don't be scared, okay, of drawing a nice big dot because your forces have to all center from it and they have to be straight lines, okay? So I don't want you drawing a little line like dot like this and then trying to show that the forces do that, that not a force. All your forces are acting in straight lines, okay? Right, so we've already identified that there's a normal force, okay? And that there is a force of gravity and there's the force of the man pushing it up and we just have to label it F normal. We've now also been told that there's a force of friction, force of friction. Okay, and the force of friction is always in the opposite direction to movement. And it says that it's accelerating down the incline. So therefore we know that the force of friction has to be in the opposite direction. And there it is, the force of friction. Okay, right. So that is your free body diagram. Okay, let's move on. Now it says the crate accelerates parallel down the inclined plane for a distance of 0.9 meters at 1.24 meters per second squared. Use the work energy theorem and calculate the work done by the man on the crate. Okay, the work energy theorem. Use the work energy theorem. Okay, so there are two ways that we can do this and we need to think about it nice and carefully. Okay, what is the network energy theorem? The work energy theorem states that network on an object Okay, let's go through it again. The net done, work, network done on the object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Okay, the network done on an object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Okay, so what you need to think about is that network is what? It is F delta X, where F is the F net. Okay is equal to the change in kinetic energy. 
I use delta K, but you can, might have also seen delta EK. It's the same thing, which is going to be a half MVF squared minus a half MVI squared. Okay, so we, let's think about what we're given. We know delta X, we know that the crate accelerates parallel down the income for a distance of that at the acceleration. We've been given the acceleration. And it says calculate the work done by the man on the crate. Okay, so let's think about this some more. Do you agree? that we could, since we've got the acceleration and we've got the initial velocity is zero, okay, and we've got the displacement and we could actually work out your VF squared minus VI squared, okay, because we've got, we can take out a half, M and we're left with VF squared minus VI squared. Okay, do you agree that we could work this out if we use our acceleration? And what am I saying? I'm saying, let me just write this out in a different color pen. I'm saying that we know that VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. So VF squared minus VI squared is equal to 2A delta X. So that means that VF squared minus VI squared is equal to 2 times the acceleration year, okay, which we've been given, times by delta X will give us the VF squared minus the VI squared. Right, so grade twirls, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this right here now, okay, this is, sorry, 1.24, and the delta x here is also 0 0.9. I'm going to leave that right there, and what I would like to suggest you do is that you pause the video or you um, come back to it and look at it again, watch it, and then pause it at this point, um, or take a screenshot, whatever, and then try and work this out for yourself and see if you can get it right okay and we will start with this tomorrow so please try this if not go download the paper or just go re-watch the video again have a great day and thank you for joining us on our first lesson